So I just thought I'll do a quick bio, but I, uh, as Chris said, he can probably talk about himself better than I can. So I'll kind of introduce you guys quickly. Uh, Co-director Chris Butler and writer of Paranormal. Uh, Chris has over a decade of uh, experience as a storyboard artist, character designer, and sequence design director on films such as Tim Burton's Corpse Bride. You might not have heard of some of these, so bear with you. Um, Universal's The Tale of Despero. Disney's Tarzan 2. Don't mention that! <laughs> the train has left the station, Chris. We're going with it. <laughs> the British comedy, Mr. Bean. Oh, no! This is all in your pocket. And a few other films that you may never heard of, such as the two. Uh, <laughs> I had to. There's a gun to my head. Over there. <laughs> I asked you at the beginning. Okay. Uh, Paranormal will mark Chris's first feature film directing de uh, debut, uh, which I think we can all say was a pretty damn good start. <laughs> and uh, most recently, Chris was head of story character design for Like Is Coraline, which I'm sure many of you have seen as well. Uh, here's a little tidbit and point of aspiration for many of you. In June of last year, or two years ago, Variety magazine recognized Chris as one of the top ten animators poised to become a household name. Which is pretty amazing. Why are you laughing? I don't have any idea about it. I was about to say the same thing. <laughs> Who do we know? Oh, no. Walt Disney. Chris Butler. <laughs> uh, sitting immediately to Chris's right is uh, co-director Sam Fell, who uh, is also a seasoned veteran when it comes to the animation world. Uh, Sam's directed the award-winning Flushed Away for Arden and DreamWorks uh, Animations for which he wrote the original story and co-wrote the screenplay. He directed another movie which will remain named, unnamed, I'll say it anyway, it's Tale of Despero, uh, in collaboration with live-action writer-director Gary Ross for Universal Pictures, for which he won an Annie Award for, uh, oh sorry, an Annie Award nomination for Best Director. Um, he also worked with Peter Lord on the Academy Award winning short, or nominated short, Watts Pig, I'm sorry, I keep getting that wrong. <laughs> Just <laughs> rubbing the salt down. Well, maybe this. I think this, actually. Um, Chris is also award-winning uh, commercial director with Ardman, amongst many other studios. So I'd like to welcome both on the stage. We've got some amazing people to talk with tonight. <laughs> Just a quick question for you. I watched this film actually uh, a little bit earlier, and as an animator myself, and someone who's been in the industry for almost uh, just over a decade now, I look at and talk to a lot of animators who talk about story and how important story is to a film. And I think it's fairly safe to say that these days there's so much animation being created that sometimes it feels a little bit like story has gone a little to the wayside for other interests. I mean, I'm saying that delicately, but I think we know what movies we're talking about. Sometimes it feels like story isn't as important. And a film like Paranorman, in my opinion, it's, it's so story rich um, and it's so timeless in the way that you guys have uh, approached the story that it feels like you've really contributed something um, important to the animation canon. How does that feel? And you know, I think people might agree with me. This is something that will last for 10, 15 years and may inspire animators for decades. Is that all? No, I'm not done yet. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Um, honestly, I mean, I've worked in uh, the story department on many movies, and uh, in some ways this was my reaction to that. I don't think story's fallen by the wayside. I think it's more that um, people found, in the 90s, people found a formula that worked, which did work. There are some amazing movies out there. But unfortunately, uh, you know, as the years go by, that formula becomes uh, constricting and repetitive and unfortunately I think you know this this movie is a love letter to the kinds of movies that I grew up watching um, it was influenced by an era of filmmaking that was I think braver more irreverent smarter funnier um, and there's no reason why we can't go back there I I found it this is the the first movie in my career that I've worked on uh, in any capacity where we've known the ending while we entered production. And, and you know, it kind of makes sense in some ways. <laughs> you know, it's like, it, it, it's, just, it's just a common thing to kind of enter, you, you have a concept, you have a hook, you go for it, and then, you know, every story artist is it's kind of beaten into them that um, five minutes in, we need a chase sequence, seven minutes in, we need an emotional moment. Um, and and you, you follow this pattern and what I really wanted to do with this was pretend to follow the pattern, and then not. I, I, to me, I just think it, it's funny, right, because Disney started this thing where you wouldn't do a script, it would be developed by storyboard artists, and the, and the whole thing would grow, and he, he kind of masterminded it. And yeah, we've seen it work, you know, like Toy Story is 
amazing. I think it's an amazing movie, and it was done like that. So, but, but in many ways, I think it's, it's, it's strange to kind of overlap the things. And I don't think that cinematography is less important than story, or performance, or any aspect of filmmaking. But I just, I slightly prefer doing it in the right order. And I think with this, the great thing was to come to this where there was a story, and there was a script that I kind of couldn't, I just thought I could commit to this. And I've been in a lot of situations actually where you're trying to develop the story while you're kind of heading into production, and everyone's pulling at the story. And what's strange in that situation is that you, your first draft of the story reel, you aren't fully committing to that story. You're just trying it out. You're like, well, let's throw it up there. You know, let's get the script, and we'll throw it up on the screen, and then we'll figure it out from there. And so you storyboard a sequence, not fully thinking about the cinematography, not fully thinking about it as filmmakers. You're just sort of throwing the story up. So often you see sequences fall apart because actually they're just not very well executed. <laughs> they're just not very well told, you know, as story as direct they're not very well directed in a weird way. There's this sort of strange kind of directing that's sort of just you're out of control, you're twelve storyboard eyes, they're just loving the film up there, you know then everyone kind of guesses what kind of film we're making. And so what I loved about this situation was that as a director I could come to this, there's a story I believe in, it's got a beginning, middle and end, there's a writer, still available, not fired and replaced. <laughs> uh, and so we can get on with the filmmaking. And actually, when we boarded the sequences, I felt like we were boarding them for real. And so we would, our camera work and our editing and our filmmaking was supporting them story and I think our first part of the real kind of played actually. Do you know what I mean? It's just it's you, you look at some of uh, the greatest live action directors who have used storyboarding, Alfred Hitchcock, Ridley Scott, both you know fully implemented storyboarding as part of their process, almost to the extent that we do in animation. Um, they were storyboarding from a script, a script that they liked. You know, they weren't figuring out the story while they were shooting. Sometimes that happens, but it, it, it's a fundamental, you know, it, it does, it, it gives you the chance to, to know where you're headed. At no point in this production do we feel lost, and that's often the case, unfortunately. How long did this take you, as far as tip to tail? I know your idea was probably terminated for quite a while, but from, okay, we're green, let's go. 16 years. 16 years. All in all. Not every day. And that's for that's for you, Chris. But as far as production is concerned, yeah, you know, Chris Chris got into development in two thousand nine. I came along in two thousand nine. Uh, we're looking at projects in development at Leica, and you know he was in development in two thousand nine. We started January of uh, two thousand ten, and we just hit the ground running. We didn't falter. It was like right, let's make this film. So two and a half years. Two, yeah, two and a half years. Okay. Um, while you were storyboarding, and you're about to shoot some of the scenes. What scenes on the storyboard did you really want to, were you anxious to see come to life in the animation process? Like, is there a particular scene that sticks out for each one of you? I think the, you know, some took longer than others. Uh, the opening scene where he walks to school, where we establish the world and his situation and the town, that took a lot of boarding. Not, not because we just had so many great ideas, you know, and a lot of it was to do with the cinematography and the spending time on the photographing the world, you know. So that that took a because that was a lot about tone, you know, and the vibe of it, you know. It wasn't. I mean, a lot of the scenes weren't just about you know, like hitting story points and gags, you know. But I think for me that that was a big deal, you know. Yeah, and the vibe of that, right? Um, but even with that, I remember the day that I got a green light uh, from Travis Knight. Um, I went back to my office and started storyboarding, and the first, I think, six pages of scripts, just just for my own benefit to see if it could work. And a couple of the ideas that I did on that first day ended up in the movie: the slippers, uh, the combing of the hair, the toothbrush. Um, and I think it was that. It was just it was a desire to set up this world in a kind of measured way, a restrained way. Um, the scene with Court when Courtney goes to Mitch and Neil's house, um, actually we storyboarded a lot ourselves. Um, we did spend a little bit of time looking for a head of story, and in the end, we because we had time, 
Um, we ended up doing it ourselves, and that, that sequence in particular, I had a very set idea in my head about what, how it should play, and it, it remained the same from my first version right through to the finished, yeah. the finished scene. I love that, and I, I mean, it's a, a, before this, but uh, I got to work with, that, with Gary Ross, a live action guy, you know, and, and it was interesting working with him because for those guys, those live action directors, they, they have to know, they should know what every shot in the movie is. Them, themselves, they have to know it. And they have to know why. So they do you know what I mean? It's like it's the director's job. So to, for us to be involved in that closely. Do you have a favorite scene, either of you, have a favorite scene that you absolutely had to have in the film but ended up on the cutting room floor and, and uh, you either regret it or don't, but do, do you have a favorite scene that didn't make it? No, actually. I'm sorry to disappoint you, but um, there is there was there were no major changes. Uh, there were a couple of scenes. Uh, that we saw the other day, and it was, it was kind of unpleasant to watch. Um, they, they were not important. They were kind of, they were baggy. They weren't, they weren't important to the plot. They didn't move anything along. We weren't sorry to see them go. We got rid of them fairly quickly. There was, there was the closest one was the ghost for me right. coming to it, you know, because there's a lot of elements, and the, cl the closest thing to that for me, and I let go of it, and it was quite rightly was, you know, where did the ghosts go, you know, because we introduced all these fabulous guys, characters, and I got a little bit hooked on those guys, you know, and really we didn't need them, I mean, we had Grandma throughout on Mr. Prendergast and the, obviously Aggie, so the key ghosts were present, the ones that mattered to the story and the film, but, but we did have a little scene where we tried to kind of address where they went when the zombies came out, but it was a bit of a can of worms, to be honest, and it, it felt like a blind alley, but... That was probably the closest thing to something. I really love some of the stuff in there, and there were, there were some lines like, you know, like the ghost explains that fear never dies, you know, and that's why they're still around. There's some, there some juicy lines in there. You guys seem to do a really good job of, uh, there's a lot of detail in terms of the physical comedy. Um, and there's really two schools of thought in writing as to how much description you provide within the script. Um, did you write a lot of those physical gags into the scripts, or were they um, something that were sort of added throughout the process? It's a combination, really. Um, some were added as part of the story process. Um, so I, there was a lot. I, I wrote a very verbose script. I wrote it almost like a novel. Um, and I thought that that was the best way to approach it, because uh, often, People reading the script can skim, and so I spent an awful lot of time setting up the world, kind of like the way the film does. Um, I had huge action paragraphs, and um, I tried every trick to reduce the size of lettering so it didn't look like it was really long. Um, but it was, it was a weighty first draft, and I think that trick paid off because I ended up cutting a lot of that stuff there. You know, it was just... It was just eloquent prose, but what it did was, I think, it, it really captured people's attention. Um, so I cheated, basically. But uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of gags. I, I think it's important, actually, to a certain extent, um, when you're writing for animation, to include a lot of the action. There's so many scripts that you read where it just says, and then they fight. And then you're like, okay, all right. And that, that's fun to storyboard, but... Um, I don't know, it's also fun to write. You know, it's also fun to have a, a, a very set idea of what it should be. But we had some amazing storyboard artists, um, one in particular, uh, uh, yeah, Julian put a lot of kind of extra kind of comic humor into it, you know. And they all brought a bit, didn't they? I mean, you, yeah. you know, you don't employ these people to just sit on them, you know? Like, they, everyone comes and brings something, and you know, that's definitely our job is to have the thing be bigger than us, you know, and grow. I think the difference was that rather than um, them creating uh, humorous scenes, the scenes existed and they were creating humorous interaction. Uh, the characters existed and I really wanted the characters to be very well defined, so I think it gave them room to, to, to play with them, but on a smaller level. They weren't reinventing the story, um, they were working within the parameters that the script gave them. What inspired you to make the movie? I, as a child, watched many movies that I shouldn't. Um, horror movies. And um, I thought, at some point, it popped into my head, wouldn't it be cool 
to make a stop motion zombie movie for kids. And, um, and then it became something more. It became not just the horror movies that I watched, but it became all the movies that I grew up watching. So it became The Goonies, Ghostbusters, early Steven Spielberg, Scooby-Doo. Um, it just became this kind of heady mix of all of these, basically every movie that was made in the 80s. Um, I, I liked, I remember watching those movies as a kid and really loving them. And um, I wanted to go back and, and play in that world, really. So I think it was, it was being inspired what I, what, by what you know, made me want to get into filmmaking in the first place. The use of rapid prototyping and 3D printers. Uh, and uh, I wanted to, to have you talk a little bit about that, not just technically, but you know, suddenly you've brought the computer in as a big player, but clearly you're still finding value in shooting on set. And I want, to talk, want you to talk a little bit about that value. Well, the, the, I guess the biggest thing it gave us, um, and it was just lucky, but we wanted a kind of naturalism to the movie, you know, like we were looking, as we were talking early on, we were trying to talk about, well, how do we make this stop frame movie different from any stop frame movie you've ever seen? How do we have our own voice? And there's some big voices in stop frame, of course, you know, and we didn't want to just be copying them or following them. And the big, you know, driving thing behind this was, I mean, it's already baked into the script, there's a kind of naturalism to the script, you know, like to the characters, to the world. It's the contemporary world reflected, you know? And so our thing was not to stylize the film in a huge way, you know? We didn't want it to be abstract or feel like it was designed away in some studio and not of the world. We wanted it to be a, hold up a mirror to the world. Uh, and so it, that's true of our lighting. We wanted a very naturalistic style to the lighting, to the set build and the way we observe the world. And, and that went right through to the acting style. And stop frame, traditionally, it, maybe it comes from puppetry, or maybe it comes from mime, you know, but it's actually quite a big style, you know, you kind of the pose to pose thing, you know, where I, I you know, where we thought it felt a bit like theatre acting, you know, where I'm like, I'm sad, you know, I'm happy, you know, that kind of, which is fine, you know what I mean, it works, but we wanted to do movie acting, we wanted to do big close ups, and we wanted to do very subtle facial acting, and, and that was part of the editing. Uh, philosophy as well, you know, so you would cut to a character listening to other characters or cut to a character at just the right moment to land the emotion of the movie. And, you know, if you read any, any book about movie acting, it's about restraint and understatement. And using the computer system to produce these rapid prototype places allowed us to do a really subtle facial movements and to and to just produce them at the resolution where we could like blow them up and do a, a true big close up, you know. So I think it's the hardest thing in the world in stop motion to not have a character do anything but to keep them alive. Am I right, Rochelle? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it was. I think it was a challenge for our animators because it's a, it's a very difficult thing to do. But I think the the rapid, uh, you know, the replacement face technology that we had that added a whole other degree of acting possibilities but alongside that we were also really innovating every other process the the puppet department um, their armature work was unlike anything that had ever happened before I think our approach on everything on this movie was um, you know normally when when someone would say we can't do this in stop motion then we would say well that's a reason to do it and um, I think because a lot of people had done their stripes on Coraline, we really did push some boundaries. I think everyone was energized and they really were willing to take on the most ridiculous tasks and they succeeded. So every part of it, you know, the, the, the RP faces was a huge innovation. It, it, it did allow us to do a different degree of acting, but everything, everything raised to it. Same with the armatures, you didn't have to rush from pose to pose. You actually, the armatures would hold all the in-betweens you wanted, you know. I think, I was told anyway, I didn't actually touch them. <laughs> <laughs> Too hard for me. Oh, you're on your private chase. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The amateurs are doing yeah. wonderfully. I had them made back in the 90s. You know. I don't do it anymore. In case anyone's not aware, rapid prototyping is 3D printed. So, how many faces yeah, were there for some of these characters? Yeah. Uh, yeah, just ask just that Google it, man. You know, like just kind of look at it, you know, because it's all out there. I, mean, I just googled it before I left. I googled it. You can buy one of these things for twelve hundred dollars. Really? Yeah. 
Now, I, I, you know, it's said that we could have 1.5 million expressions for Norman. We would never need that many because the human face doesn't need that many. Um, but it gave us the ability to to really play with that amount of nuance, you know. Um, it is sci-fi, it is ridiculous, you know, when you see it, when you walk in, it's faxing an object, you know, it's teleportation. Um, and it started on Coraline, we, we had these machines, some bright spots that Leica had the idea, they weren't built for this, um, but they had this idea of, of printing parts in 3D, so you'd sculpt them in the computer and then print them out. Coraline's faces were all black and white, um, and so they had to be, every face had to be hand painted. Coraline had 10 freckles each face. That's one face uh, every frame. That's 24 frames a second. Had to be hand painted. 10 freckles. Um, and I think that was the limit. And we probably killed a few people doing it. But, um, but on. Freckles, Yeah, I know. It's ridiculous. Why do we do this? But um, on this, we suddenly there was color 3D printing. So we could paint the faces however we wanted in the computer and print them out that way. So Neil, as you saw, has thousands of freckles. No one could ever hand paint that, nor would they want to. Um, but it did, it opened up aesthetic opportunities just as much as it did nuance. What is the relationship like between uh, traditional and digital media, uh, specifically in the scenes towards the end where uh, Agatha and, uh, and Norman were, you know, I guess it was all electric and uh, the witch face in the sky. It seemed like it was pretty CG heavy, but did you treat any of that it was uh, traditionally? All, it was all designed conventionally to the extent where it was all actually built conventionally in the first place, you know, so we would do some 2D work. But that storm, we built it, you know, or Nelson and his team built that storm out of like tool, you know, like ballerina dresses and someone rigged it and Tristan lit it and we kind of photographed it and so w that's not the final result but that's where we started you know so we all stood around and looked at this storm in the studio and Brian Bantola VFX supervisor took everything from that and the same with the Aggie ghost at the end you know it was all Nelson not just one version but like many versions you know there was hot glue, hair was made of hot glue originally or blown, blown ink on paper or cut out and or, or uh, etched Laser cut. Uh, so yeah, it's very, very tactile, very you know, hands-on design, 3D design process. And then yeah, okay, we went to the we went to the VFX guys, you know, to make it work. <laughs> Don't laugh like that. <laughs> oh, that's the best of both worlds, you know. We weren't we weren't militant purists about anything. I, I think you know, in the end, you want to get the best image on the screen and. And so you use whatever technique is, is, is at, at your hands. And, you know, I think it's easy to think of stop motion as this historical novelty that's untouchable. And what makes stop motion beautiful is the handmade quality. I'd say that over 90% of this movie remains, you know, handmade. Every, wherever possible, we would have puppets interacting and then augment it with, with CG. So our approach was still to maintain what makes this medium fantastic in the first place but not to limit ourselves the way people have in the past. Yeah, congratulations on a brilliant movie. Um, and second, you know, you were saying that it took over 10 years in pre-production before you actually got to get the green light to start producing it, right? Oh, that sounds so sad. Um, <laughs> well, three times for 10 you know, you, years. You can definitely see why. It's a, it's a very unique, uh, you know, story where you're talking about scary stuff, you're talking about death and kids. So I want to see if, you know, there are any bumps in the road and, you know, to pitching this thing, to get it, it green lit. And if so, you know, how did you overcome them? Um, I honestly do not believe this project would have been made as it is um, anywhere else but Leica. I think Leica is a uniquely brave studio. We have as our CEO, and on this movie, the producer and lead animator, um, a man, Travis Knight, who is very passionate about the medium. And what he wants to do with Leica is tell stories that no one else will tell. I, from my point of view, this is like a pipe dream, you know? It's like I was working on a movie, I presented a script. Not only did they like it um, and champion it, they said they, they greenlit it, but then they asked me to direct it, and they said, you're the only one who's going to write this as well. That doesn't anywhere. So I am 
happy that this place exists. I'm happy that it is a place that is bold and has the strength of its convictions. Um, but it is really down to the studio. I, I at no point uh, did any were we ever faced with executives saying this is not what Middle America wants. In fact, I, I, I'd say it's just the opposite. We're encouraged to to, to be bold, um, and that is, you know, that's exciting. Why did you choose co-direction, and how did you split responsibilities? It's just like you know, every movie's different, and every relationship's different. Every team is different. I've worked in teams. It's a team game animation in a way, you know, like it's a, it's a big operation. It's like, it's like building a cathedral or, you know, it's a big void. So two, two is stronger than one if you can get it right. Uh, we didn't split the responsibilities particularly, uh, and we did that deliberately. I mean, I've seen movies, I won't name them, but I know movies that were co-directed where they did split it. And I've seen the fights that go on or not, not physical fights, you know, but just the, the pulling uh, that goes on. And you know, I saw, a, I know a movie that was directed. Each alternate scene was directed by different directors, and one is all close-ups, and the other ones are wide shots. And you just, just feels incoherent. And breaking it front end, back end, I think it can be equally incoherent. What, however you do it, the main thing is that you share the same vision and you agree. And so, Chris, I always, I really liked Chris's script, you know, and I really like the story and I like the characters. So I didn't come in wanting to fix it, you know, or change it, and I didn't think that was necessary. I was excited about the opportunity to elevate the directing of it. Um, but we, we, so we agreed already, you know, and then we just spent three, four months figuring out a common vision for every single department and how the movie should move, move and feel, and then we stuck together for the first year pretty closely. Uh, it was actually our approach on everything. We, all, we wanted everything to be a singular vision. It's the same with the design. Quite often in animation, you, you feel different hands have done different things. We tried so hard to make this feel consistent, not just in our approach, but in everyone's approach. Everyone got the signature style. Every, the characters uh, fit the background. They didn't feel like there was something else. And I think, hopefully, the intention is that five minutes in, you forget that you're watching an animated movie and you're just engaged by the characters. Um, I think we succeeded. I think they succeeded. Um, I'm just going to ask one wrap-up question, and then um, that's it. So I just actually want to ask you guys, apart from the inevitable awards that's going to come piling in the door in the next six months, I'm just laying against that here, I know. Um, what's the future for you guys? What's uh, what's next? Any plans? Any other features you guys are stepping into? I think just keep doing different things. I mean, I'm not stop right now. I mean, I've been away, and I come back, stop right now. is first, obviously. I, I'd say the same. I want to do some more writing. I, I did enjoy that part. And next time, maybe not take 16 years to do it. <laughs> we look forward to whatever you guys come up with next. This is a fantastic film. Thank you so much. Thanks for, for showing up. Thank you.